Notre Dame is number one. Notre Dame with a miracle win is a He's going again. Notre Dame and score. Um, what is Zach Martin's status, and is there anybody else that you got to kind of watch during this early part of the prep? Um, Lewis Nix has got a, a, a wrist, uh, but he's, uh, he's had two very good days of weight training and conditioning. He was on the woodways yesterday. Um, I really think that from a health standpoint, Eric, there's nobody that um, wouldn't be able to practice on Friday, you know, going, going forward, moving forward over the next couple of days. So uh, we got out of the USC game pretty, pretty good. And, and if we were playing yesterday, uh, we would have had probably even Zach for the game. We kept him in the boot for four day, five days in total. Uh, responded very well to that. And then there's, there's, with this much time, there's a lot of potential distractions too. You've got, you know, fifth year guys um, trying to make decisions, and also you're going to have coaches being interviewed from your staff. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you plan to handle those two elements? Well, the preliminary conversations have already taken place with those guys that have another season of competition. Uh, we haven't made any decisions, but um, a lot of that is, you know, a lot of our guys know where, where they're moving. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, we have some guys that, uh, you know, want to look at the NFL opportunity, and we filled up paperwork for guys to uh, be evaluated by the NFL. And then we'll have coaches that will be um, targeted by other programs. That's a good thing, all three of those things. That means good things are happening in your program. Um, those are the kind of problems that I want to be able to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, because that means that you're developing your program in a manner that uh, uh, is, is putting you in a position to compete for championships. So those are all things that um, uh, the real good programs have to deal with. and. Uh, We'll deal with them appropriately in the same manner. Just a last little follow-up. Can you share who the guys are that are going to submit the paperwork? The no, I, I'd rather not do that publicly. I think that, uh, that it's pretty self-explanatory. I think when you're talking about guys that um, you know really feel like, or we feel like, and, th and this is a two-way street, Eric. It, it's not just them. It's, it's, I think we need to do it as well in making sure that these guys know where they stand. Hey, Brian. When you're preparing for a, for a game and a team, I'm sure history doesn't play into it. And certainly the 20-year-old kids don't think about it. But as a football guy, can you take a minute and step back and look just at these two teams being on the same field for a national championship? Iconic. You know, two, two great programs with great tradition. I mean, how can you not think about the houndstooth hat of Coach Stallings, oh, excuse me, Coach Brian, and then Coach Stallings? And then, and then you think of uh, Error and Lou. I mean, just the tradition. It's college football. It's, it's what it's supposed to be. And I think that history and tradition is, is terrific for the game. And, and it makes the game so attractive. But for me, it's still about the process. It's still about I want to be the best team on Monday, January 7th. Uh, so that's my focus. But there's no mistaking the history and tradition. And it's good for college football. One other thing, and it's kind of out of left field, you coached in the MAC. Would yep. you have believed the day would come that the MAC team would be in a BCS Bowl? Well, actually, by being in the MAC, uh, I had always hoped and dreamed that I would be that one coach that took a team to a BCS game. So it's not too far for me. And, you know, Nick's first job was at Toledo, and, and I bet he probably felt the same way. Let's be that team. Having said that, it's an incredible um, incredible achievement for, for them to, to get in. Uh, the BCS that we are currently in was set up um, and they followed all the rules. They got themselves where they needed to be and I give them credit for it. The game day set, you mentioned the SEC specifically as a model for success. I know Ralph Russo kind of mentioned it on the call before. How generally or specifically did you look at the SEC, how those teams are generally built when you, when you wanted to figure out that's what it takes to win a champ? Well, it started with controlling the line of scrimmage. You know, we felt like we were in a pretty good position uh, to continue to recruit very, very talented offensive linemen. That, that seemed to be part of 
what Notre Dame had shown had been successful at. Where, where we really took a specific model was the defensive lineman in the SEC. Uh, and that physical presence, whether it be against the run or, or on the edge of your defense, we needed to find guys like that. So when I, when I use that SEC model, what we were specifically talking about is developing your defense and in particular developing uh, your front seven. Uh, so uh, we went about um, with that in mind. And look, if you look hard enough, you can find them. And, and, and we looked really hard and we worked hard at it and we found some of those guys and, and we think that that was the first step in, in helping us move our program um, to, a, to a championship level. When you look at them and you look at you, I mean, do you see a whole lot of similarities between Alabama and yourselves, the way these teams are constructed and operate? There's some similarities. There certainly are, I think, in terms of the line of scrimmage. Uh, I think we're, we're continuing to develop uh, the skill level of our football team. Uh, but uh, I think that there's some more similarities up front on the offensive and defensive line. Hey, Brian. I'm just curious. You've known that you were in this game since the end of the USC game, but I'm just curious how sitting up in that seat a few minutes ago and you watched the number one show up on there and it's official and everything, what did it feel like in that moment? I was just proud of Notre Dame and, and um, proud of my players. Uh, it was nice to be able to share that with your team, you know, being here tonight with my family and our coaches' family and all of our staff. Um, I think it's a sense of pride. Um, and... and um, Happy that um, our players uh, could share that with, with everybody else in the room. Have you already started breaking down film? Oh, yeah, we've already looked at Alabama. What stands out? Just, you know, I, I think more than anything else is, you know, everybody notices size and strength and physicality. I think what really stood out to me is that they were going to exert their will uh, and it didn't matter that they were down, they were gonna run the football. They were gonna go with their strength. And, and I, I like watching teams that, um, that, that wanna beat you mentally as well as physically. And, and they mentally won that game as much as they did physically. Kind of going off of Brian's question a little bit about building the lines and, and what other steps or, or parts of the blueprint were there in building this program? And what, what was, if someone were to want to do what you did here in three years, what, what is the blueprint for, for building a program? Well, I think first of all, you have to set a bar and, and, and you have to challenge your players to reach and exceed that bar. So, you know, that, that, that requires a consistency. Uh, a clear, concise communication of what the goals and objectives are on a day-to-day -day basis and that you're not going to settle for anything less. Uh, I think that has to happen. I think there also has to be uh, an environment where your, your, your players really uh, enjoy the process, the process of getting to where we're trying to get to, coming in here and, and wanting to improve on a day-to-day -day basis, having energy and enthusiasm um, to, to be the best they can be. And it's not in a Gatorade bottle, you know what I mean? It's something that, that, that takes time and it, it takes a commitment from everybody in the room. And, and, and I think those are things that you really can't put your finger on as much as you develop over time. And I, I think that's, that's what we're seeing happening here. When you came here and, and, and even in the years since that you, when you first got here, you made a few changes from the training table to the, the, the root of the walk to, the, to roping off the locker room area. Um, and you've also been very, I think, cognizant of the tradition and preserving a lot of those things. And I'm just wondering, as you were kind of going down that line of, of what needed to change and what needed to be preserved, how did you decide on those things? And, and the second part of the question, how important were those changes to what you've got yourselves in a position to do right now? Well, I think it's important to understand, first and foremost, what the true distinctions are at Notre Dame. And, and those distinctions need to be highlighted. I think that was done first and foremost. I think the second piece of that is how you can um, create an atmosphere that's collegiate, that allows your kids to be college students, at the same time wanting to be champions. And so, taking both of those and making them priorities.
priorities of distinctions and priorities of collegiate, college kids, 18 to 21, and, and making those priorities. And just last one for me, when did you start to get the sense that this group was capable of doing what they've done so far? How early? I, I thought uh, that it was going to just be a matter of time because, you, you know, again, and I've said this a number of times, the, the guys that were sitting in these chairs the first two years as well, they did everything we asked them to do. We just didn't play the right way yet. It was going to come. We just didn't play it. The, the right way on Saturdays. But they were committed. Um, they did everything we asked them to do. Uh, but it was a process. Uh, if there was one singular moment, uh, it, it probably would have been in camp uh, when, when we, we took some time off to go up to uh, Diamond Lake. And generally, that thing turns into the swimmers and the non swimmers. Uh, this was a team that you could tell enjoyed being around. Guys that didn't play golf played golf because their buddies were playing golf. Guys that were swimming that don't swim were swimming. Guys that were playing cards under the tent. It, it, you could just sense it that there was a, a, a group of guys that really enjoyed being around. And I've always said, when your guys care about each other in the locker room, you got a really good chance. Uh, you said on TV yesterday you had talked with uh, Oregon and LSU staff just about preparing for this kind of layoff. What did you uh, gain from those conversations? Try to get another opponent. They, they've played Alabama and <laughs> they, they, uh, they know how tough they are. But what we were trying to do is confirm some of our thoughts relative to the, to the, the schedule and how the, the schedules should look. And we were pretty much right on with what we thought the schedule should look like leading into the championship game. It's a one game deal. Uh, we're, we're just trying to be better than Alabama on Monday, January 7th. So our entire focus will be on a one game season, trying to be better on Monday, January 7th. So you can understand, we don't want to be better than Alabama on the 27th of December. So the preparation, uh, it was more about checking our work and calling those schools that have done that with the long layoff. And, and we felt comfortable with those conversations. Switching gears a bit, I'm not sure there's a blueprint for a player going to a different city every day of the week for a different award ceremony the way Manti is this week. I, I don't think you worry about him, but how do you try to handle the circuit surrounding him these next seven, 14 days? I told him, get your, you know, Coach Longo worked him out hard today. Um, you know, he's most concerned with his, his conditioning and, and being able to uh, come back uh, for practice. I said, listen, this, this week, you, you just got to you gotta write it off. It's not going to be a football week for you. Um, when you have an undefeated football team and you have a great player, uh, awards generally follow you. And this week, he's, he's going to do the best he can to, st to work out in the hotels and focus on these postseason awards. And, and that's really the focus this week for him. Brian. Over here, just uh, injury follow-up. Devaris, how far is he along coming he's back? He's doing really well. Uh, he started moving his shoulder the first week after Chris Brown caught a couple of passes out there. It was really quick medicine for him, and he's been on the fast track ever since. He will, um, week five will be full contact for him. So that's, that's the, the date for him. Uh, he's running already. Uh, we will have non-contact with him starting on Friday. So uh, you'll see him in one-on-one -on -one without anybody shadowing him. Uh, getting in and out of his routes. We want to get to some specific route running uh, and some change of direction stuff, but he's making great progress. Alabama has BCS championship game experience and, and you guys don't. Is that an advantage for them? And if it's not, why is that not something that would be an advantage for a team who's, who's been there, done that? Well, I think if the moment's too big for you, it's an advantage. I don't know the moment will be too big. We've played at the Coliseum, we've played at Oklahoma, we've played at a, a great venue last year uh, at Michigan, Michigan State. I'm not concerned about that. Uh, I think what they have is a great football team. And so um, I'm not as concerned about that as I am making sure our team's prepared on that one day to be the best team in that stadium. Kind of following up, I think Eric asked about coaches being interviews. There's a report out of Boston that Bob's gonna interview for that position next week. Had, have you talked to him about that? Um, and how do you prevent that from being a distraction? 
First of all, it, it doesn't surprise me if they wanted to talk to Bob Diaco. I mean, I think he's the, the finest defensive coordinator in the country. So I, I think, uh, you know, Bob is, is uh, a bright football coach. Uh, we have conversations about it. Um, uh, and I, all I could tell you is that it doesn't surprise me that he's part of it. I don't, I won't get into the specifics about conversations about particular schools out of respect for them and their process, but um, it wouldn't be surprising to me that they'd be after Bob Diaco. I was just kind of curious, what do you tell him about preparing for that? that you, know, you know, I... <laughs> I'm not a guy that's going to run down his office and give him the top ten list of you know questions that you're going to get asked on an interview. Uh, but if he asks me for some some input, um, I, I I've been happy to to uh, help him with that. Um, but I, I will tell you this: Bob, Bob Diaco is 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 an incredible coach that, uh, and he knows he fits so well here at Notre Dame, um, and that's why we haven't had a ton of conversation about it. Brian, to your left, uh, there's a tendency for us to focus on the 35 or 40 days or whatever as a, as a negative. Do you look at it as a positive, not only to prepare for an opportunity to win a national title, but all the other benefits that can be derived from doing all the things you're doing over this time? Absolutely. We really think that we've got the nucleus of, of, of some great young players that are going to get a chance to develop during this period of time as well. It, it's going to be a little like preseason camp, you know, where we're going to get a chance to do a lot of fundamental work. We're going to get some young guys running. We're going to see Amir Kailau run around out there. You know, we're going to get a chance to see some guys that, you know, haven't played this year. That's really exciting to me and our coaches. There's no question about that. Um, as well as um, getting our guys weight back up and getting stronger in the weight room and developing our football team and, and getting another you know, a little bit more weight on an Everett Golson. Uh, those are really exciting because they, they move your program along and then get a chance to focus uh, on Alabama. So, yeah, there's, there's really positive things that we can take out of this time and, and make sure that, that, our, that our guys know that um, they don't have to be involved in all three of them right away. You know, we'll, we'll work our way up to it. So if you're a senior, you know, you don't have to be out there taking 60, 70 reps, you know, the first couple of weeks. You know, we'll, we'll really work our way into it. So I think it's exciting, yes. Coach, uh, just talk about the new shirts your, uh, your guys are sporting tonight, Unfinished Business. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we wanted to, to display where we are. And, and the mindset is I came before our football team and, and essentially asked, all right, what do you want to do? Is 12-0, and 0, is, is, this, is this it? Are we going to just kind of flim-flam our way through the next two, three, four weeks? If that's the case, let's get that out right now, and we'll, we'll have a nice break here. We'll go bowling a lot, and we'll do those nice trips that, that you all want down to South Beach. Or do you want to finish this thing off? So let me know so we can move forward. And it was a pretty clear statement that they have some unfinished business. And, and so that's why we went with the theme of unfinished business with our football team. And it clearly, um, you know, getting to 12-0 and 0 is, is one thing, but um, finishing off at 13-0 is what this team wanted to do. So that's the significance. I know you talked about Manti in terms of him wanting to be physically th this week involved. Um, how about mentally? W w do you worry at all about him getting burned out a little bit by just being involved in so much of this stuff he's, right now? He's burnt out. There's no question. He's on fumes right now. but. Um, you know, he also respects uh, where he is in this process. Um, to be mentioned for the kind of awards that he's in, um, he's finding the energy um, to be engaged in all these things. But he's a football player. And, and uh, you know, he wants to be with his teammates on Friday and Saturday when they practice, and he's not going to be able to be there. And so that's hard for a guy that's wired that way. But he respects the process. He understands how important these are um, and how they're recognized nationally. So um, he'll get through this week, and uh, I think he'll get a little time off during the, during the holidays. Uh, he'll, be, he'll be ready to go. And can you talk about Everett and how key these six weeks will be for his development? Well, I think they're, they're absolutely crucial for us in, in, in being the best team on Monday, January 7th. Our quarterback has to continue to grow and develop, and not just himself, but 
you know, others as well, but clearly the quarterback gets a lot of the focus. And, and this will be a great learning opportunity for him. He'll be able to do so many things that we're not able to do during the week and focus on some fundamentals, uh, really get in the weight room and get after it. Um, and, and I think, you know, really feel like he's prepared for Alabama. And, and that's, that's going to be a good thing. Thank you. Oh.